Major funding for this program was provided by Shelby Cullum Davis Charitable Fund, Incorporated by Andrew Davis. Additional funding was provided by Acevis London Family Fund at the Santa Fe Community Foundation and Barbara Erdman Foundation. And by the Kind World Foundation, Pat and Ruth Connery, Catherine Webb, Harold Foley and Jenny Nagan, the estate of David Elliott Young from Mary McCachran, and by New Mexico PBS viewers like you. Thank you. Hey. We're gonna be late for the concert. Meet mom and me at the plaza. Come on. Okay, I'm on my way. My name is Chris Moore. I'm a mathematician here at the Santa Fe Institute. I love math, but some of my friends tell me that their experience with it was a bit more like this. C squared equals A squared plus B squared. But for me, math is more like this. Listening to music on the plaza. It all starts with a vibration. The drummer strikes the drum and makes it vibrate, which makes the air vibrate, which makes your eardrums vibrate. Your mind does the rest. Translating those vibrations into beats and tones. Whether these vibrations come from a drum, a reed, or a string, we hear them as musical notes. Each instrument vibrates in a unique way, with a unique mix of frequencies that comes from its shape and its material, from the math that tells it how to move. When we put these sounds together, we get harmonies, chords, melodies, songs. And now math is making music. And whether that music makes you get up and dance, or sing the blues, or feel truly transcendent, that's no coincidence. It's your intuitive connection to the notes and the relationships between them. The ratios and rhythms and patterns that excite our minds and move our hearts are the same harmonies we find in subatomic particles and the motions of planets and stars. Music and math let us hear and see the patterns all around us, the elegance and wonder of the world. When you come up with a new melody, or I find a new pattern in math, we're using the same parts of our brains, 
and feeling the same feelings. And I have a feeling it's getting a bit late. My family! Come, Come on. on! Gotta go! We're headed to Santa Fe's historic Lensic Theater. The seats are filled with music lovers. And after tonight's special performance by the Santa Fe Symphony Orchestra, I hope math lovers as well. Join me on a journey to discover the majesty of music and math. Ladies and gentlemen, the Santa Fe Symphony welcomes you. My name is Guillermo Figueroa, and I have the great honor of being the conductor of this wonderful orchestra. Joining me on stage tonight is a mathematician and music fan. Please welcome Chris Moore. You may think of music and math as separate, but it hasn't always been this way. In ancient Greece, music was combined with arithmetic, geometry, and astronomy in a liberal arts package later called the quadrivium, the fourfold way. Plato believed that these four disciplines allowed us to study numbers and patterns in different ways. Just as geometry lets us see patterns in space, music lets us hear patterns in time. The most basic connection between music and math is rhythm. If we start with a steady beat and add another twice as fast and another twice as fast as that, we get four beats per measure. On the other hand, three beats per measure gives us the familiar rhythm of a waltz. Let's hear the Santa Fe Symphony play the Blue Danube. Some composers alternate these rhythms to create interesting combinations. Listen to the Santa Fe Symphony as we play a selection from Leonard Bernstein's West Side Story, where he alternates two beats and three beats in his classic celebration of immigrant life in America. Notice how your ear picks up the alternate rhythms. One, ta -ta, two, ta -ta, one, two, three. Leonard Bernstein created that rhythm by taking a unit of time and dividing it sometimes into two pieces and sometimes into three. As we'll see, ratios like these play a role not just in rhythms, but in notes, chords, and melodies. But what is a musical note anyway? When the first violinist plays a note on his violin, what's happening in his violin and what's happening in our ears? Well, sound is vibration. Every time a string wiggles or a hummingbird flaps its wings, a wave of pressure travels through the air. And if these vibrations are fast enough, 
we hear this series of waves as a continuous tone instead of as individual beats. The number of vibrations per second is called the frequency, and different notes have different frequencies. For instance, a middle C, which we'll now hear from the symphony's first trumpet, vibrates 261 times per second. On the other hand, that low note from the contrabassoon that you heard at the very beginning of also Sprach Zarathustra <laughs> vibrates only 33 times per second. That's such a low frequency that you can almost hear the individual beats in it the way we would in a drum roll <laughs> or a cat's purr. At the other end of the scale, a high note from a piccolo is vibrating more than 4,000 times per second. Now, it turns out that each time you go up an octave, for instance, from low C to middle C to high C, this corresponds to doubling the frequency, vibrating twice as fast. That high note from the piccolo is seven octaves above that low note from the contrabassoon which means it's vibrating two times two times two times two times two times two times two, or 128 times faster. In ancient Greece, Pythagoras discovered the math behind these notes by doing experiments on simple instruments. Let's follow in his footsteps. This is a monochord. It's just a string stretched across a movable bridge attached to a sound box. We've tuned it so that right now, more or less, it's a middle C. Now let's see what happens when we make the string shorter. If we make the string half as long, we hear the same note an octave higher, another C. What's going on? Well, if the string is half as long, the vibrations have half as far to go up and down it, so the string vibrates twice as fast, and that two to one ratio corresponds to the octave. Let's make the string one third as long, tripling the frequency from what we had originally. This takes us to a new note from C to the G above it. Here's a middle C on the piano. Each time we go up an octave, the frequency gets twice as fast. Each time we go down by an octave, it gets twice as slow. We hear these doublings without realizing it but our ears can only take us so far. A grand piano has seven octaves, but mathematically these frequencies go on forever, both above and below our hearing. To help you visualize this, we've made you a much grander piano, an endless piano. Below the notes we can hear, elephants communicate using subsonic rumbles. And even the earth and sun ring like bells, about 16 octaves below middle C. Far above the notes we can hear, dolphins use high frequency chirps, nine octaves above middle C. Molecules vibrate trillions of times per second. Gamma rays bring us bursts from distant supernovas, making the electromagnetic field oscillate a billion billion times per second. 60 octaves above middle C. This range of frequencies from high to low lets the orchestra tell us some amazing stories. Let's hear the Santa Fe Symphony play the Grand March from Prokofiev's Peter and the Wolf. When one object vibrates, it can resonate or cause sympathetic vibrations in another. Every physical object, such as this wine glass, has natural frequencies at which it likes to vibrate. If you provide a vibration which is powerful enough at just the right frequency, you can create some exciting effects. Famously, 
If an opera singer sings loud enough at just the right tone, she can cause a wine glass to vibrate so much that it breaks. <laughs> Resonances don't just make things fall apart. They make each musical instrument vibrate in a unique way. This Claudney plate, named after its inventor Ernst Claudney, lets us see the shapes of these vibrations. It has a speaker underneath which makes it vibrate and lets us control the frequency. I'm going to sprinkle some sand on top, and once it gets going, the sand will get bounced off the parts of the plate that are vibrating the most, and it will collect at the still points between them. The shapes and patterns the sand makes will show us how the plate is responding or resonating to different frequencies. Let's start with a low frequency. Do you remember the monochord, the single stringed instrument from before? The lowest frequency consists of the entire string going up or down together. But at higher frequencies, one part of the string is wiggling up at the same moment another is wiggling down. The same thing is happening here. And the sand is just collecting at the point in between them. Let's see what we can do at an even higher frequency. And as the frequency gets this high, the shapes of the vibrations get very complicated. It does look like a raccoon in a kaleidoscope, doesn't it? This violin-shaped plate will give us a taste of how the soundboard of a violin responds to different musical notes. Of course, real violins are much more complicated. When you hear a violin being played, you should imagine the body of the violin vibrating with these beautiful, intricate patterns responding to different notes. It's an amazing degree of complexity. It also shows you how a high note on a violin isn't just a low note played faster. The violin responds in completely different ways to different tones. This is partly why the sound of the violin is so rich and so complex and sounds so wonderful in our ears. In fact, even a single note on a violin has many different frequencies inside it not just the basic or fundamental one we hear. These layers of sound give each instrument a unique flavor. We call these hidden frequencies harmonics. They're kind of like backup singers, singing at frequencies twice as high, three times as high, and so on above the fundamental. But where are they hiding? Let's look inside a violin note and see how these harmonics combine to make its unique sound. This audio analyzer breaks down the violin's sound wave and shows us the frequencies inside it. These peaks here show how strong the different harmonics are and how much each one contributes to the sound, the fundamental frequency, and the hidden harmonics two, three, four times as high, and so on. Now let's try to reconstruct the violin by putting these harmonics back together. If we play just the fundamental, it doesn't sound like a violin at all. Let's add the second harmonic and the third. As we add more harmonics, including more and more of these hidden frequencies, the richness and color of the real violin appear. Let's hear how the same note sounds on different instruments, each with its own unique mix of harmonics. Here's a middle C on the oboe. The trombone. The piano. And a kazoo. We love how the orchestra uses these instruments to represent different characters. In our next piece, we'll hear the finale from Prokofiev's Peter and the Wolf. See if you can hear all the different characters in it, including the flute as the bird, the oboe as the duck,
and the clarinet as the cat and the bassoon as the grandfather have now joined the parade. Here's the Santa Fe Symphony playing the finale from Prokofiev's Peter and the Wolf. We've learned that the unique sound of each instrument comes from its shape and how it resonates. But when you add electrons, vacuum tubes, and antennas to the mix, things get even more interesting. Let's visit a remarkable workshop in Santa Fe to learn more about this. It's a place filled with rare antique clocks and vintage electronics, too. The man at the center of this collection is Andrew Barron. You can hear him now playing one of his prized possessions. Hey, Andrew. Chris, it's good to see you. Thanks so much for showing me your workshop. It's my pleasure. This is fantastic. This is an original theremin? It is. It's one of the 120 or so that survived from the original 1929 production by RCA. So one of these antennas controls the frequency and the other controls the loudness. Exactly right, yes. When you bring your hand close to this antenna, Aww. the note goes higher. And if you want to make it louder, you can bring your left hand up over this loop on the left side of the cabinet. So this is an electronic instrument. You might think it would make a boring, simple beep, but uh -huh. the sound is so much richer than that. Leon Theremin wanted something that was harmonically rich, that would emulate the sound of orchestra instruments. And he did it by having two frequency generators in the instrument. We call them oscillators. Theremin connected one of those oscillators to this antenna that controls the pitch. And so when you bring your hand near it, it shifts the frequency of that one oscillator and it tugs on the other and it actually pulls that pure symmetrical wave into a different shape. It creates a more complex yes, sound wave. exactly right. Can I try it out? Sure. Okay, I, I promise gonna, I won't break. That's all right, come over here and let me lead this for the moment, okay? <laughs> People associate this now with bad sci-fi and horror movies, but back in the 20s and 30s, this was a, an instrument. It was part of the orchestra. People wrote music for it. There were That's great right. players. The original repertoire was actually all classical in, in the first uh, uh, decade or so of the instrument's existence. It wasn't until 1945, Alfred Hitchcock, uh, using theremin in the soundtrack of a movie called Spellbound. <laughs> And who were the great players, the famous virtuosi of, of the theremin back in the day? The uh, really superstar of her day was Clara Rockmore, and uh, she performed with uh, the Philadelphia Orchestra. Let's relive the glory days of the theremin and listen to Clara Rockmore. Mm -hmm. 
Harmonics are part of the math inside individual notes, but they also let us combine notes into melodies and harmonies that are beautiful to the ear. Remember how going up an octave corresponded to doubling the frequency, a ratio of two to one, about as simple as a ratio could be. It turns out that many of the most beautiful chords and harmonies come from ratios that are almost as simple. For instance, if you take middle C and play the G right above that, we get a ratio of three to two what we musicians call a fifth, and it sounds like this. If we take that same G and play the C right above that, we get a ratio of four to three, what we call a fourth, and it sounds like this. A ratio of five to four gives us the ingredients of major chords, such as C major, which is made up of C, E, and G. And we'll add another C in the middle just for fun. So we get a C major chord. And a ratio of six to five gives us a minor chord, as in C minor. Now, in case you've recognized all this little excerpts we just played, it's because that's the iconic beginning of Also Sprach Zarathustra of Richard Strauss, with which this program opened. Let's hear it again. Thank you. These ratios have been resonating with us long before Richard Strauss used them in his compositions. And to help us understand this ancient connection between music and math, my friend Penelope Penland has organized this party at the Hotel Santa Fe. Hey Penelope, nice to see you. How are you? Everybody, your attention please. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Humans have been making music for as long as we've been human. Whether you write music, play it, or just listen to it, you're part of that history. And beautiful music has beautiful math behind it, patterns that we sense intuitively that make music fun, moving, and sacred. Hildegard von Bingen is one of the earliest composers whose name has come down to us, and one of the earliest we know of who wrote complex melodies. Here is the University of New Mexico's Hildegard Schola performing one of her pieces. The music you just heard is almost a thousand years old, but these patterns go back even farther. Thousands of years ago, Native American flute makers here in New Mexico created beautiful instruments, and these ratios still ring in their music today. I'm delighted to have you all meet Marlon Magdalena from Jemez Pueblo, 
and I'm so interested in your flutes. Most of these flutes I've made, uh, this particular one I'm hand carved with a small knife to get the shapes that you see on here. So as a person from Jemez Pueblo, we have traditional ways of life and a lot of those ways are very religious. So we view everything that we do as a part of that religion, as a part of our way of life. So this song that I'm going to play, it's called Welcoming the Buffaloes. Before humans ever walked the Earth, these ratios and resonances were at work in the universe. Ganymede, Europa, and Io, three of the moons of Jupiter that Galileo saw through his telescope, which you can see too through a backyard telescope or even a decent pair of binoculars, are in a one to two to four resonance. In the time it takes Ganymede to go around Jupiter once, Europa goes around twice, and Io goes around four times. It's as if they're singing a low C, a middle C, and a high C. The music of the spheres has always inspired music down here on Earth. The composer Gustav Holst may have been thinking more of astrology than astronomy when he wrote his suite, The Planets, but is full of these heavenly ratios. If you listen carefully to his movement, Mars, the bringer of war, you'll hear that he uses a rhythm of five beats per measure to create a menacing march toward battle with a mixture of pleasant and unpleasant harmonies. Here's the Santa Fe Symphony playing Mars from Holst's The Planets.
One of the things which makes Mars's march to war so menacing is a chord called the tritone, or the devil's interval. Remember the pleasing sounds of the fifth? The tritone is just one semitone lower, but that makes all the difference. Sounds strange, doesn't it? Dissonant and unsettling. See if you can hear it in Richard Wagner's classic chord from Tristan and Isolde, where he uses it to convey the tragedy of those two lovers. A tritone is exactly half of an octave. For instance, it takes us from C up to F sharp, and another tritone will take us from there up to the next C. But remember that going up by an octave is equivalent to multiplying by two. So that means that the tritone must multiply by something, which when we multiply it by itself again, we get two. We call that number the square root of two, but it isn't a simple fraction. It isn't the ratio of any pair of whole numbers. Lots of ratios come close, but nothing quite works. Written in decimal, the square root of two never ends or repeats. It goes on forever. Like pi, we call it an irrational number. The followers of Pythagoras loved whole numbers, so this came as quite a shock. Legend tells that they threw its discoverer overboard to punish him. Perhaps this irrationality is why the tritone sounds so strange, and why composers like Wagner use it to create dissonance and tension. Chords and melodies that step outside the simple Pythagorean intervals are called chromatic, from the Greek chroma for color, and they add a lot of color to a piece. Composers like John Williams use them to express the eerie and the unfamiliar like a school of teenage wizards fighting the forces of darkness. Next, the Santa Fe Symphony goes to Hogwarts. <laughs>
we've seen and heard that humans love patterns. We're tuned to enjoy them without even realizing it. We like making patterns where there were none before, and we like finding them when they were hidden. That's why we like puzzles so much. And at our house, puzzles are a big deal. Hey, guys. Hi. Hey. What did you just build there? This is a soccer ball. <laughs> In both mathematics and music, sure. a classic kind of pattern comes from symmetry. Dun, da, da, dun. Yes. Good job, it. Mom. We look about the same if you flip our image in a mirror. Some of our more distant relatives look the same if you rotate them. These intricate Moorish mosaics from the Alhambra in Spain look the same if we shift them over or rotate them. I did it! Nice. Beautiful. Very nice. Another kind of symmetry, both in mathematics and the natural world, is a fractal. A fractal is something which, when you zoom in on it, it looks the same because each part is a smaller copy of the whole. Hey, Dad, we have a fractal in the fridge. A fractal in the fridge? Yeah. A fractal in the fridge? We got it the other day while we were at the farmer's market. Nice. It's a broccoli. Yeah. But what makes it a fractal? See how there's one big cone? Uh-huh. This cone is made up of lots of little cones, which are made up of lots of little cones, which are made of lots of little cones, which just keeps getting smaller and smaller. Can we eat it later? Yeah. <laughs> The most famous fractal is the Mandelbrot set. Zooming in on different areas reveals endless variety, but always with a smaller copy of the entire set hiding deep inside it. A musical fractal would be a piece where the theme harmonizes with a slowed down version of itself. That way the small scale structure of the piece is echoed on a larger, grander scale. Johann Sebastian Bach loved to play with symmetry. In many of his fugues, the themes are heard upside down or even backwards. He also liked to play with fractal symmetry, where the themes are given in different scales or sped up or slowed down. We're going to play a fugue by Bach, and you'll hear first the theme in the French horn. And then an upside down version of it in the second trumpet. And a slow down version of it in the first trumpet. Finally, a slowed-down version of the theme on the tuba. See if you can hear all of these themes as members of the brass section of the Santa Fe Symphony put it all together when they play Contrapunctus Number 7 from The Art of the Fugue by Johann Sebastian Bach.
Our brains love music like that Bach fugue because we love patterns. We love to recognize a melody and hear it again in a new form. But we also love to be surprised. We love it when patterns go sideways and turn out to be more complicated than we thought. Take the prime numbers, for example. A prime is a number which cannot be broken down into smaller factors. Five and seven are prime, but six isn't because it's two times three. We can find the primes if we're willing to do a little work. Start with all the numbers. One doesn't count. Circle two, and now cross out all the even ones. Next, circle three, and cross out all the multiples of three, six, nine, twelve, and so on. The next one left over is five. Circle it and cross out the multiples of five. Circle seven and cross out its multiples, and so on. The ones that are left are the primes. That wasn't so hard, but the primes have many secrets. You'll notice that there are some pairs of primes that are just two apart, five and seven, 11 and 13, and so on. But what's the pattern here? Are there an infinite number of these pairs? Do they go on forever? No one knows. It's these patterns and surprises that fascinate me as a mathematician. They're what makes math so intriguing and exciting. Prime numbers can add suspense to music. Here's a piece in five beats, a prime number, which creates a sense of excitement and international intrigue. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five! We've heard the math inside notes and instruments. The ratios that make up rhythms, chords, and harmonies. And the symmetries and surprises that make music so fascinating. From ancient times to today. Music and math both reveal something fundamental about our world. A tension between simplicity and complexity, between order and chaos. They speak to our brains and our hearts in endlessly surprising ways. And they're both very much a part of what makes us human.
In our finale tonight, the composer John Adams starts out with a simple rhythm on the woodblock, but he quickly overlays this with more and more complex rhythms, making it harder and harder for us to hold on to it all. If you can feel this joyful confusion, this sense that a pattern is always just a little too complicated to grasp, so that you're always just on the brink of understanding it, you'll know what it's like to explore the frontiers of mathematics. Ladies and gentlemen, the Santa Fe Symphony playing John Adams' Short Ride in a Fast Machine.
Major funding for this program was provided by Shelby Cullum Davis Charitable Fund, Incorporated, by Andrew Davis. Additional funding was provided by Acevis London Family Fund at the Santa Fe Community Foundation and Barbara Erdman Foundation. And by the Kind World Foundation, Pat and Ruth Connery, Catherine Webb, Harold Foley and Jenny Nagan, the estate of David Elliott Young from Mary McCachran, and by New Mexico PBS viewers like you. Thank you.